the biggest problem is like kids wanting to be NBA players. Mm. If you want to play in college, you watch college, not NBA, not six ten guys that AD like you want to. That's your favorite player. You're, you're six one. You're, you're going to be a backup point guard. So once you get that down, then you can expand your game. Yeah. But if you're like, some kids are naturally gifted, so it's like you're just born to score and stuff. But if you're not, you got to get those down, concrete, and then move on. Sure. Sometimes even if you are. What's up, y'all? Welcome back to Ships Across the Border. My name is Max. I'm here with Chris. And today we have on another one of our Former, I wouldn't say teammate because I never played with him, but a former Elms player for five years. Former runs teammate. <laughs> former run, definitely former runs teammate. Uh, before we get into it, remember to like, subscribe, follow us on Instagram at SATB, uh, on TikTok at Ship Across the Border, and let's get into it. Yeah, so I want to start. Oh, this is DJ. I didn't oh, say his, his name. name. DJ, DJ Edelin? That's yeah. how you say last name? Edelin. Edelin? Mm-hmm. Okay. Five year player, almost scored a thousand. Absolute bit bucket. Of a story there, but um, I'm going to start these how we start every single one. How did you start playing basketball and what was your childhood like? Um, so I didn't pick up a basketball until my sophomore year in high school. Holy shit, that was late. Yeah, I played a lot of football. I was really good at football and was going to focus on that. Then I had a few injuries with football Mm -hmm. that made me flip to the basketball. And I took it serious for a year, made all region in the high school area. And then at that point... I had nothing for football, so I was like, let me move forward with basketball. So you were fairly naturally gifted then to pick up a basketball and have like a really good high school season. So I, growing up, I didn't have much. So you're always bound to like go outside. Mm-hmm. And all I could do was by myself was shoot a basketball. So that's what I did every day. So I didn't have cable like that growing up. And then high school came, we lived in a two bedroom with me and my sister and my mom. So all I, I didn't want to be around women all day, so I just went outside and <laughs> shot the basketball. So sophomore year is like when you start taking it seriously, but you, all, you were building the foundation uh, since you were a child. Not necessarily. Like, did you play structured basketball until grade 10? No. No. Okay, so how, that must have been a really weird adaption period. So freshman year, my mom made me try out for basketball. Just to, Everything was to stay in shape for football. So track, basketball, baseball, anything that could keep me in shape during the year up until football. So soft, I got cut my freshman year because I'm from the South. South sports are politics. Coaches don't like you. You don't get on the team. So sophomore year, I, I, my, my freshman summer, I actually tried and did training for basketball. Then my sophomore year, I came in, made the JV team, and then they were like, we want to move you. I I worked so hard, I moved up to varsity my sophomore year. I mean, I didn't play, but it was nice to get up to varsity level and know I'm actually good at like basketball. Did you have people around you that were playing basketball, like your friends, parents? My best friend. He was uh, His name is Jalen Stepney. He's 6'5", six, 6'6". Six, six. He was a starting center. He... He played basketball since he was a kid. And when you picked it up, did you like it more than football initially, or it was just the injuries that forced you to play basketball instead of football? Like, would you be a college football player right now if it wasn't for those injuries? Yeah, I, I would. I would. I just like hitting. <laughs> what and position were you? Receiver, and then I played nickel. I don't know if you know terms in football. I played nickel and linebacker at times. Um. So then coming out of your sophomore year, considering you could only play basketball, what were you were you looking at college basketball at that point as like a substitution for football? Like that that was the goal then? So my goal I had I was very mature from my younger age because my family went through tough times. I, my first thing was like I wanna make money. So I was doing HVAC, heating and ventilation and conditioning and whatever. So that was I was just gonna go to trade school and do that. But then I realized I was really good. It was the newspapers. Where I was on the cover of our town's paper. We were 6-0 and and whatever. I was like, let me give it a shot. And I got invited to Buffalo Wild Wings Classic. And I think that's where South Hall found me. Me and my, he recruited another kid, Tyler Sterling, from that. And we were friends before that. So it was 
kind of cool that me and him both came to the same school. Mm-hmm. So, and did you have any other offers coming out of high school? Um, I could have went D1 Juco, Frederick Juco, but they told me I had a red shirt. And then there was a few other. I I didn't want to go Juco. Mm. I didn't want to take. I don't think I took it serious enough to work two years of my life to try to transfer somewhere. Mm-hmm. So so coming into this, like you hadn't really played structured basketball, so it must have been a bit of a shock for you to try and get all these concepts down in like a two-year span. Mm. I, I was very like an athletic kid, so I watched it, but I never like got the, what is it, the fundamentals of basketball until then. Mm-hmm. And someone taught me, and then – my AAU season, I played AAU my sophomore year and then to my junior year. My AAU coach was a really big help because me and him trained after practice, weekends when we didn't have tournaments. So he really helped me get to where I am. What were your uh, like skills as a player? Like, What did you excel in as just on the court and what did you, I guess, not? Well, like Kind of like a player profile for you, like a scouting report. Well, everyone knows I can shoot the ball. <laughs> that That's a given. Um, but I also, here at Elms when I played, I was undersized. And South Hall play, had me playing power forward, sometimes center. I can bang with six, seven guys. You can see with Sam. I was going to say, every time, because every time Sam walks in, he's like, oh, my fucking yeah, God. I saw that. He's like, please tell me Sam's not coming today. Yeah, but that's also coming from football. So, like, yeah. I can bang. A physicality. That, I can bang down. I could be under but I'm going to bang. And I think coming in my freshman year, I was more of a wing slash two guard. And then I had a transition because all our players, like all our sides left. So I had to put on weight. But before that, I was more of a chase down blocker, shoot the ball, try to do a putback dunk. So I pretty much got slow. You're getting up like that? Yeah. Really? Since you started basketball late, not kind of a similar story. I started when I was like 13 or 14, not grade 10, but it was still fairly late compared to when most people start basketball. I noticed when I got to college basketball, there was holes in my game that I didn't fill because I had all of those years where I didn't play like structured basketball. And one of them was being pressed. Like I could not, I was a point guard and I could not deal with ball pressure like full court. Mm -hmm. Did you have any holes in your game like that that you noticed? You're like, shit, I wish I would have been seven years old and they were teaching me this and I can tell like I'm at the college level and I didn't get this. Like... Like, looking back at my game now, there's so many things I wish I, like, worked on. Like, my – like, finishing with my left hand, mm. the the simplest thing. Um, then, like, how, you know how TC, he can see his next move before the first move. I never worked on that. My first instinct was to shoot the damn ball. <laughs> so, that was a big flaw in my game because I was so focused on shooting the ball when – if a person's closing out, just go by instead of shooting a contested shot, and I get subbed out the game for taking a dumb shot. Mm-hmm. Makes sense. You guys know, struggle with that as well. It's like I know when somebody's like sprinting at me and chasing me offline. If I catch the ball, like I wanna, I'm challenging myself to shoot it over them as opposed to, I guess, pump faking or ripping ball. And I'm starting to develop more of putting the ball on the floor, one two dribbles. But I feel like that's really something I need to work on and, as well. It's like another like big thing. A lot of college kids don't. The mid-range, like, I understand kids are taught to, like, everything should be layups or threes or free throws. No one shoots mid-range shots. And it's so open to our game because everyone expects us to pump fake and go to the room. Mm-hmm. Instead of pump fake and taking one dribble, shooting the mid-range. Yeah. Now that you say that, and I was thinking about it, some of the best guys that we've played with at Madai and here, like, TC is a fucking mid-range assassin. Mm-hmm. And then you look at Dante Wilcox, was going to be played with, who's now at a D2 in Pennsylvania. He was a mid-range assassin, too. A lot of the guys that we've played with, I'm realizing now, one of the reasons they were successful is because they can get to the mid-range and no one really expects that shot to go in. Right. And you look at guys, NBA, look at Paul George, Luca. Like, he shoots crazy threes, but his sweet spot is that post-up. Then LeBron mm-hmm. with the fade. A lot of people, AD, a lot of people don't realize the mid-range is probably the, the, it's a free throw to me. I kind of want to break down how your college career went and how it panned out. So coming into freshman year, what were your stats and how did you feel going into that season and all that kind of stuff? Freshman year, I don't know if you were here. Freshman year, I came in, played probably half the season, so I couldn't wear a shirt. I fractured my uh, hand, so I missed a half of the season, missed the playoffs. I was probably averaging like five or six points. 
I started a few games, but that I was at a low point then because I broke my hand and it's my shooting hand, and that's all I'm good at. I came back my uh, sophomore year better because I worked. I couldn't wait to get the cast off. Then I had an attitude problem. People could tell you that. <laughs> um, so I was supposed to start my sophomore year. That's where you talked to me. He was my coach my sophomore year. And he helped me a lot fixing my attitude. Because you could be the best player on the court, but if your attitude is funky, nobody wants to play you. Mm-hmm. With the injury thing, that is kind of like a make or break for a lot of players where you can either get discouraged by that and you can be like, well, fuck, it's over, or you can get motivated and come back even better. Right. And that's that's what um, I faced a lot of adversity in life. So me breaking my hand eight hours from – I'm from Virginia. So eight hours from, like, my support really was tough. Like, I flew home, got my surgery, and then flew back a few days later. So it was more of like you got to – figure it out on your own up here. I can kind of relate to that. We both can because our parents are both, we're from Canada. You're so right. they're eight hours away. So everything, I had to get my social security card, all my stuff set up for this work visa and shit. And then you're just on your own because there's no help here. Yeah, it was, it was tough, but I had a, it was uh, Tyler Sterling and Nicholas Brown. They, it was a good, those are two guys that helped me through that. So after college, obviously you said you're from Virginia, but now we like we know like you're I don't want to say in this area, but around around Mass, you come to our open gyms. What are you kind of doing after college, and how come? I guess you were attracted to stay in the Springfield or, or Mass area as opposed to going home. So my um, I got in a serious relationship, so it was either like I do my masters at Elms that one year or. I go home and follow, because I got my uh, undergrad in criminal justice. I plan on being a cop for a little bit, then try to get in the FBI. Then I switched my whole career path, got my MBA, and now I'm doing government work. So it's completely opposite things. That's life. But I also like being on my own, like being away from, like I love my family, Oh, don't get me wrong, but it's like I don't have to be that there when they need me. But at the same time, I'm missing out on me. Like my my sister, she's getting married. I have to fly down, but like I missed the last six yeah, months sure. leading up to it. Then my mom, she got proposed to, missed that. Awesome. So it's like I'm missing memories, but I like be. I'm always like being isolated from everyone, so... So then junior year and senior year, I kind of want to break those down too. So you broke your hand, came back sophomore year, and how did that season pan out? Sophomore year, I had the attitude problem, came back second half, started every game, and I think I averaged 12 points, was leading the team in scoring and rebounds. Junior year was by far my best year. I shot, I think, 42% from three, and I only took threes. Um... We fell. We that was the first time since my freshman year we got a playoff spot, but that year I worked really hard, fixed my shot. I was in the gym with South Hall every day at noon shooting, and then senior year was COVID, and I was in the best shape of my life, and I was ready to go try to be player of the year, and then COVID hit, so that derailed it, and then that put me in a like a deep depression because I was ready to be that guy finally because I it worked it led up to my senior year each year I got better and then COVID hit when you say attitude problems I kind of want to dig into that a little bit so like what exactly does that mean and how did Meech help you solve that because I know he said he also had attitude problems so that was kind of like a helping out someone who was like him situation it was more of like more of like I think I know I'm, I'm right every time. It's imposed of like, just shut up, shut the fuck up, and listen to the coach. Mm-hmm. And it was more of like, if we were like fucking up in practice, instead of me being like, come on, y'all, it was like, what the fuck are y'all doing? Mm-hmm. Like, this is why we're fucking losing. <laughs> and, and, and Southall, he told me you have to speak to certain people certain ways. 
Like, I've made a few people cry the, the way I spoke to them. <laughs> I'm not gonna name names, but my freshman year, I made a guy cry. Mm-hmm. As a freshman? Yes. And Another he, freshman or an older kid? He was he was an older kid. I Dang. think he was a junior or senior. That's Dang. unironically the fifth story I've heard about someone crying on a college basketball team. It's, and I've seen one emotional. like in person. So there's emotion. I've seen we've seen multiple. Yeah, which is crazy. Well, it's just a lot of ups and downs, and like everybody like cares so much because everybody everybody like you said is. A lot of people move eight hours away from home or mm-hmm. by themselves. All they have here is, is the game that they chase, and just everybody cares that's, so much. There's a lot of emotion. In, yeah, that's in the, the thing about coming to Elms. You, you just if you come here to play basketball, you go to school, play basketball. There's nothing to do around exactly. here. That's very true. You got to drive an hour to go do something. <laughs> so, how, how did that develop in terms of like your attitude going into junior, senior, and the fifth year? I guess because of COVID. Well, me. Meach pretty much told me to take a step back and, like, look through a coach's POV instead of looking through my point of view, mm. where it's like, I see everything on the court, but he sees everything on the back end that's fucking up. Yeah. And that's where I took a step back and gave, became more of a leader, and that's when people started gravitating towards me. And that's where my game became better. Because when I had the horrible attitude, nobody wanted to play with you. Nobody wanted to give you the ball because you're, you're bitching the whole time. And I, I, I understand. It, same thing, me playing the game, the video game. I, you fucking up, I don't want to play with you. <laughs> what game do you play? I play, I play 2K, I play MLB. You play Park or just like? I play Rack Program. No way. It's sweaty yet. No, now we have to have a conversation. You play 24 or uh, current gen or next gen? Next gen. Damn. I'm playing next gen next year. I have a PS5, but all my friends have PS4s. So we'll be playing current gen. Mm. I think I'm like pretty convinced like I'm the best player. I only on current gen. I don't, see the thing. I only got current gen because of like the graphics on other games. Yeah. I will play current gen 2K. I did it for the past two years before. Yeah. Are you nice? Yeah. Do you think you can beat him? What I, position are you? So I'm a six eight two guard. Mm-hmm. Got like eighty three three point shot, eighty ball handle, eighties in defense, ninety four driving dunk. I'm I play like I play with a five man. Mm-hmm. Like, I have like seven or eight guys, and we like yo who can play, and we play like every night. Mm-hmm. And this season, um, we're like fourteen and zero, and I'm averaging thirty four points a game, shooting sixty five percent from three. Jesus, I'm fucking good. So but I also like. I play exactly how I play in real life. So in transition, I'm running to the corner of the wing for a three, and we play a zone. And I'm taking no. Yeah, I'm just, I'm not. Shit. I'm not breaking people down. I'll show you clips after. But like I'm shooting transition threes. I'm I'm taking one drill pull ups. I love a floater. Mm. I kill. In the, I kill with floaters, and like I'm nice. It's I glitchy. Play, yeah, but I just I don't be like dribbling a ton and like isoing. I really just like I play exactly how I play in real life, just magnified like. See, that's the complete opposite with me. <laughs> he probably plays like Aaron. So there's another guy on our team. You know, obviously, you know Aaron. Yeah. He plays um, next gen. I play current gen. So we always talk because he we can't play each other. So mm-hmm. it's impossible. We always like go back and forth and send each other clips. He'd be like, "Yo, I'm better than you." And he's <laughs> he's a point guard. And he just like does a lot of dribble moves and step backs and all that stuff. He's like, yo, you can't do this. You can't do this. And that's not my bill. It's not my player. I say, I don't do all Like, I make a move, and if they bite, if it don't happen, I pass the ball. They give it right do, back. Do you play with a five, man? Uh, yeah. I made I made this build, actually, because I made the build first because I yeah. was a big man. It's a three-level threat. But my build is uh, I have a 94 driving, 92 three ball, 92 ball handle, and an 80 block. That's That's so, cool. like, if the point guard drives by me, I'm... Good build. But then I can play the bottom of the zone and block a big man's shot. I love 2K. I love, like, the... Comp- like, we haven't got much comp, to be honest with you. Like, we're beating teams by, like, a lot of... Points. I mean, pro M 3s were 38 and 4. Yeah. I, would, I, would, I just play rec 5s. But I, I just love, like, the competitiveness and, like... Obviously, like, none of my other friends actually play basketball for real. So, I'm the guy in the party, like, yelling, yo, rotate, rotate. And it's like, I, we take it so seriously. And I love it. It's just, it gets my competitive juices flowing right. in another way other than basketball. I mean, you guys are in college. I, I got to work. Everybody, all well, my friends work and tired. We yeah. go to the gym after. So, I, you want to get on? Uh, I'm tired. <laughs> Oftentimes, we talk about how lessons or skills in basketball can translate to life so with the attitude thing did you take some of those lessons and then bring it into your real life 
Yes, but I also brought some of the like the bad stuff because like I don't like the company I work for. Okay, respect the honesty. Because he's like a tyrant, but like because of that, it brought out my old attitude with interacting with people. Mm-hmm. So like people, I I run a group like my team. I run my team, and if he pisses me off, they're getting the the back end of. Like my attitude, mm-hmm. so like I feel bad as a leader. Then I have to come back the next day and be like, guys, I apologize. Mind you, I'm 25, but I, I'm controlling like uh, overseeing, overseeing 45 plus. So like they don't care about I'm young, but like that messed me up. But it also taught me um, same thing with my masters. Masters in the basketball taught me a lot moving into the adult life because I learned how to speak up in front of... I was always scared to talk in front of a crowd. Our master's program, they put you in front of 30 people and you have to talk. So now I have to work and we're on... Because I work remotely. We're always on meetings and camera. I have to talk in front of 100 people. So it's kind of like... I'm nervous, but at the same time, it taught me. It taught me a lot. Gets you out of your comfort zone mm-hmm. and like just growing in, in other ways. As you were going through your career, did you ever think about the coaching route? I want to coach now because, like, watching you guys, it's like I can help you guys make a little adjustment, and it's like it will flip your game. Like you, want please. To we need a player development coach. Like I badly. South Hall is now the AD and doesn't have all the time in the world. Like I, probably one of the only people. Like we kind of just do. He only has like a one slot per day, really. Mm. Of like before practice, where we can work out. So I taking advantage of that. But it'd be so much better for everybody if it was more flexible and you could work out in between your class and stuff like that. Right. I'm telling Meech because Meech said that he also did a lot of player development. Yeah. Um. We talked to him yesterday. And I feel like we could benefit. From, like imagine, Sam. Working with DJ, yo, that's that's, that's the biggest part. I would like everything I see him do. Instead of him like doing the post up stuff, which looks good, his game is just like he could be, he could play here one year, go fucking somewhere else, and go like Division Two, II, Division One. Yeah. If he, if he like someone actually worked with, mm-hmm. like Sam has yet to set a damn ball screen. <laughs> <laughs> You're the biggest, strongest kid on the court. Why why are we not setting the screen rolling? And maybe catching a lob. He, he can, I've never seen him catch a lob. Actually, oh. the only lob I've... Keep in mind, Sam, been on the podcast, 6'6", physical specimen. The only lob I've ever seen him catch was in the kids versus student... Or the student versus teachers game um, in Blazer Madness. And he put it on a teacher's head. But that's the only <laughs> lob I've ever seen him... What teacher was it? Damn. Kimball? No. <laughs> may have been... Um, may have been the soccer coach. Maybe was Wysocki? Wysocki? No, 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 no. The girl soccer coach. It may have been. <laughs> Sean? It's even worse. It may have been. Or maybe, I don't remember. I don't remember. But he, Yo, he dunked that's on crazy. it. But I'm, I'm saying, on. like, Professor. with you guys and, like, you guys play St. Joe's, Connecticut. Yeah. So they going to get D1 kids mm-hmm. that are idiots that are supposed to be D1. Yeah. Sam, uh, like, he needs to work on ball screens and shooting. Not just mid-range. Like if he gonna yeah. shoot a mid range, he just cannot be. Oh, he has to face up and yeah, shoot like face a face up jab. Like yeah, I've always said if Sam could be the kind of kid where you could like trust him in the post, and then on the fast break you, you could hit him, and then he could just do like a, a high pickup or something, and then punch it on someone's head. He could play at the division two level right now. He he just needs like guidance. Somebody needs to work with him. Yeah, and it's, like I understand. He told me Southall wants him to work on post moves. It's not. It's a post. It's just a post hook. Like he just wants him to be able to catch it. Like face the back. Gotta think right now. Like he's not a reliable option, and the, the oh, easiest sure. access reliable option would be if he could hit a sky hook or no, like a mini hook in the post. That's mm-hmm. like the first step, and then eventually, hopefully, you could hit him on the break. Maybe hit a move, and then like it'll just develop develop from there. Yeah. Please, please come and be a player development coach. Please look into that. Imagine that we just what he comes set it up. Year, set it up. That'd be crazy. We had one at Madai. His name was Seti, and he played at Madai for four years. He was a big man, and we had a seven footer come in who was not super gifted to be seven feet tall. So like mm. he had no touch whenever, and you could slowly see the, the development happening over the first year. And by the fourth year, if that would have, if our school didn't close, he would have been a very, very good player just because of the player development we had. And when he just got on, on campus, he was seven, like 6'11", and he could probably, he could inconsistently dunk. 
and like make like if he missed a layup, it'd be like, oh, it's it's it's, it's James. James. But by the end of the year, he is beating every single big man on our team in post one on one and like he's fucking six eleven and he's six eleven like six eleven two seven like thick. He's built size eighteen shoes like a fucking oh, specimen. A fucking wow. Yeah, yeah. Now he's. I mean. He also, couldn't defend for his fucking life. He can block like, shots, though. Yeah, but if you put him on an island with any decent guard, bro, it was a nightmare. <laughs> he's like a baby gazelle. He's like a massive baby gazelle. Yeah. <laughs> no, the first week of training, we had to do... Uh, shout out to Samaj, man. Shout out to Samaj. I haven't talked to him in a minute. Yeah, but it's James. We had to do a 1.8-mile run in under 11 minutes, or the team was going to do suicides for the first practice. Mm. And James got it in like 30 minutes and we were doing we're doing all these drills and everything and like trying to get and dude he got back to the dorms and i heard i overheard a phone call he was having with his mother in the shower and he was crying he's like i can't do it my body hurts like i need to get out of here come get me like he was broken (laughs) mentally and physically no he's a good dude he's uh he also did like basically redshirted pretty much i think he was checked in one time last year but this year he's played a bunch of games he was a john jay in new york he was a john jay school of law which is dope which is a good school and they're pretty good, and hopefully he'll continue to grow, and hopefully they have someone working with him because he could definitely be a fucking specimen too. He could be because no Division three teams has a seven footer. You're never gonna see that. I'm so rare. With that's decent. I'm saying with you guys, like I would have to mend a relationship for me to come back. Yeah, that's very true. So that would be the biggest obstacle. I would love to come back and help, but like way things ended. It, I don't see it happening. Yeah, I would probably do it off the court, just how I come play pickup with you guys. Yeah. If there's a time, I will set up a time. Like I want to get into coaching because I'd be trying to coach the NBA games. Like Kawhi, what the fuck were you doing last <laughs> game? Like what are we doing here? Like you're getting blown out and you you're just not giving a fuck. That kind of brings me into my next line of question. You already brought it there, but when you look at the current Elms team, what they have going on, what what kind of changes would you like to see, and what do you think they need to do to become a more successful program? First, y'all, the first thing y'all need to do is work on shooting. Not you. you. You can shoot. The team as a whole, because you guys are so undersized when you play matchup with other teams, Got it. you have to be good at shooting because – you watch film on you guys, you take, what, 12, 15 threes a game? You make, like, two. I took 15 by myself <laughs> in games and could give a fuck if I only made one. But it was more of, like, spreading the floor. It'd be a threat. But because you guys couldn't shoot, they could pack the paint. And our best players, Aaron, RJ, TC, are all downhill guys. And, and if that's, you have five guys in the paint, then TC's got to finish – and he's finishing them. But, I mean, yeah, TC has a nasty package. But, like, it would be just a lot easier and way more effective if mm. he had more space. But let's stay about – don't get me started on TC. Because TC has beat me in shooting drills, and, I, and he takes one three a game. I told, I actually told him that before every single game. I'm like, yo, TC, like, they hey, you see what he does to pick up. Step back off one leg. <laughs> Three-point. I'm just like, why are we not shooting – because – the only person that consistently shot the ball was Jake. Yeah. And he didn't give a fuck. That's that's the have the yeah, you have the, to have the that, least give a fuck person in the world. That shit's going up. That's that's the kind of mindset. Not I'm not saying that because then you won't get playing time if you just chucking shit. But you have if for it to go in, like a lot I feel like a lot of the guys on your team this year were scared to shoot because South Hall would take them out. And that was a problem with my few years. A lot of kids would not like be aggressive because they were scared to get taken out. I could give a fuck. I would go up on three people, take me out. I, they're gonna go on a twelve over run. Then you're gonna have to put me back in. Mm-hmm. So it's like you have to be confident. And I could see you guys. You don't need to work on chemistry. I could see it. Yeah, we fuck with. You. We have a good group of guys. But it's chemistry on the court. Yeah. Like there's people wide open and it's looked off. It's just it's. A lot of people, and coach is right. Like coach, like diagnosed this like pretty early in the season. We kind of weren't able to put it together in the sense of when stuff goes wrong. And you can even see him pick up. Mm-hmm. If you're down six three, the person who brings the ball up is going to shoot the ball because right. everybody wants to be the that hero. guy. Everybody wants to be that guy. And there's less. Of, I think if we can just trust each other a little bit more and just focus on the end result of winning as opposed to who kind of we puts could. the ball in the basket, then I think it would be a lot better of a team. Yeah, that's that's just people have to put their ego aside. Yeah. 
A lot of a lot of guys can't do that. Yeah. And that's the kids that can do that win. Is that something you saw in your career with your the team that you played with? So what? like putting the egos aside, like that happened or that didn't happen? <laughs> Excuse me. Um We had a few bad apples every year. It seems so, to be a reoccurring theme. I think that's everywhere. I don't know, man. Well, I don't think there's like a few bad apples at St. Joe's. They wouldn't be fucking 25 okay, and 0. Well, that's not the same. But also, like, in a program like that, like, you're not allowed, like, here, like, I feel like, and I feel like a lot of places, like, not that things are let slide, but it's just a little bit more relaxed in the sense of, like, lenient. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, like, at St. Joe's, you do something, you're done. And the thing is, like, they have such a notable thing that everybody is, like, perked up, suit and tie, like, everybody's going to listen. And if you're not, you're going to be. They're gonna be. You're gonna be cut. I mean, I don't know if he's changed his way. South Hall wasn't like a dictator. Yeah, he never like enforced something. Like if someone messed up, we ran. Yeah. Like I, I got kicked out one time in f- five years of. You saying you should have been kicked out more than one. For time? sure. <laughs> I didn't got in fights on the court. <laughs> Like, kick me out, prove a point. Mm -hmm. Like, I was, because that was, that's what, I'm not going to get into it, but he could use me as an example, and I'm fine with it. So, like, if I were to cut somebody out, tell me to get the fuck out. I'm I'm fine with it. I go go in the room and play play the game. (laughs) But that was just, my few years, it was more of, like, those bad apples, made half the team rotten. Then we had a solid group of guys that played well, but those bad apples would get on the court and fuck it all up. We've kind of noticed the same thing. Even as like the first time we came here, and now we've heard it from like Coach P and a few other people, that people kind of wish he was more of a dictator sometimes because he's so nice and he kind of refuses to call people out and then things just get out of hand and you don't have any structure. I think by the end of the season, like a lot, like he couldn't, like, I can't speak right now. He was not letting as many things slide. And, like, being more on people's asses and more yelling and being more authoritative. And I think we kind of were putting it all together. Like, we went to overtime with LaSalle, who was uh, in the semifinals. We beat Anna Maria by, like, 30. Like, we mm-hmm. started to put it together near the end of the season when he started to hold people more accountable. And so hopefully that's something that he can bring into next season. He also said that the begin- beginning of his career, he was really trying to be a dictator. And he said he didn't like the way that it felt so, yeah. for him because it was like the opposite of his personality. So, I mean, I guess he did like a complete 180, but I think he needs to do a little bit more of a 90 degree turn on this one. That was the thing with me. Like I knew his approach to coaching and I liked it. Mm-hmm. Cause at the end of the day, it is a lot, sorry to cut you off, but it is, it's a lot um, more of a positive environment to be around somebody who would uplift you than tear you down. Right. But then at the end of the day, there's also like there's a line, and some things need to be assert need to be addressed assertively. But he is a very pl- like last year. I love Coach Shaq. Shout out Coach Shaq. I knew, we were, I, knew I knew we were gonna get but, like, back to Coach Shaq. Our coach Madai, like was terrifying to play for because he would just cut you. He was ass a off. fucking Navy SEAL basically. Like, he wasn't actually Navy SEAL, but he moved like a Navy SEAL. But those are my type of coaches. So that would, I kind of yeah. see that because yeah. like he would just cuss anybody out. I like stuff like that. Yeah. So like, grew up playing football. Yeah. Like they tell you get the fuck up and you're puking. Yeah. And then I came here, I had to adjust myself because South Hall was nice. Like, keep shooting the ball instead of why the fuck are you taking that shot? <laughs> so, yeah. like, South Hall, like, as a person and as a coach, he was a, but people, those bad apples took advantage of it. Yeah, and that's yeah. unfortunate. That's and he yeah. never enforced anything, so they just kept doing the same shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kind of like a KYP situation where it's like know your personnel and, at Madai, our old school, we had the dictator, and then there was also another coach who was like, "Is good cop, bad cop." Yeah, so very you, good so, cop, bad cop. So like, I mean, the, the bad cop sometimes yelled at the good cop. <laughs> like, there was a little bit of disconnect there, but like that, there is a balance of like having a guy who's a dictator and who can cut stuff off at the root and make sure that shit doesn't spread to the rest of the program. But then you also do that soft side for some players like him who would panic and chuck up a shot. And it's just like it's, some kids don't thrive in that environment, right? And that's the, that's the thing here. I, I, you need a a coach that, and that's kind of what Coach P is. I feel like, and in, in some sense, is like Coach. Guess by your facial reaction, you don't agree. In the sense of like Coach Sal is a good cop, but Coach P is a bad cop, and in the sense of like he's holding guys accountable because he does a lot of the subs, and so he'll be like, "Get this guy, out of here. get this guy out of here," and so he does a little bit more of that. But I feel like 
unfortunately, he obviously he has a lot of stuff going on, and he's not around as much. And he's, right. at pra- he's at practice as much as he can be, but he's not at every single practice at every single moment. So there are definitely moments that Coach Telfo would not, or Coach P would handle differently if he was there. Yeah, I feel like. Co- like if you watch him during the game, he's the one screaming, yeah. yelling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. South Hall's just. Yeah, <laughs> South Hall's a lot more X's and O's, and he's a very, very smart guy. Very, very yeah. Smart. Like I had a, a fucking buzzer beater. This guy, <laughs> Coach Adam and Coach P are, yeah, let's go. I'm just like okay, <laughs> but Coach P brings that. But if Coach P was more of like South Hall told them, but then a minute later pulls the kid aside and rips him a new ass, yeah, that would work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also, you got to know who you're speaking to. Yeah. Because, like, some kids will cry. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get your take on the high school level and what you think. Because you joined late and you had a pretty successful high, co- high school career. Mm-hmm. What are some mistakes you think high school players are making that are holding them back from playing college basketball? I would say watching NBA players play. I fucking love that answer. Jesus Christ. Like, I have a kid in Canada who's obsessed with Anthony Edwards, and he's 5'11 and white. He's like, you're not playing like him, bro. I'm sorry. I, I think that's the biggest. <laughs> study that TJ McConnell film. <laughs> the biggest problem is, like, kids wanting to be NBA players. Mm. And, like, I had to, my favorite player, not all time, but, like, my guy is Blake Griffin. I want to be Blake, but I'm not 6'10 and punching on people. But I wanted to emulate my game after Paul George. Not shifty, but crafty, slow, and could get a bucket. Mm -hmm. But I never watched him. When I watched, I watched college. If you want to play in college, you watch college. Mm -hmm. Not NBA. Not 6'10 guys that AD, like you want to, that's your favorite player, you're you're 6'1". You're going to be a backup point guard. And that's the biggest problem, in my opinion, because everyone wants to be like, I love Steph, but he fucked the game up. <laughs> he, like Everyone wants to shoot a fucking deep three now. Mm-hmm. And it's like, if you don't practice the shit like he does, you can't, you're not going to do it. That's what I was going to say. Like, you could love Devin Booker, but like, you're not, you don't, you didn't spend the thousands of hours going to the gym to hit that pump. Sidestep, like, and so you, how can he be your favorite player and how can you try and emulate his thing if you're not doing, working on the things that he's working on? Like, mm-hmm. if you love D Book, but then you're in the gym working on that stuff and adding that stuff to your bag, right. that's cool. But you can't just be like, yo, I want to be D Book, I'm going to try this shit. That's what gets you sucked up. Yeah, that's, lot, what gets you not even, that's not even, that doesn't even get you in the gym. A lot of kids also don't do the work outside of basketball, yeah. like nutrition, weightlifting, ladder work. Anything outside of just the ball, kids don't do. Mm-hmm. And that's a big, big thing because when you lack lateral movement, why is that? Slow. If you just fucking just play pickup all the time and shoot the ball the whole time, you're going to be Steph Curry. Mm-hmm. He can't play defense, correct? Yeah. So it's like if you want to make it and and be successful, learn what you're good at and then find someone – that does that, but like as you're like, I don't. Jaden's brother, Juni, my best friend. He he never watched the guy over fucking six one. He he's five nine. He watched every point guard, uh, like Isaiah Thomas. He's adding attainable things to his bag. Right, and then it's <laughs> like he learned the passing part about PGs. Everybody wants to be the scoring PG. Like Mike, he's a great. System PG, but he lacks offense. It's, I see it in pickup. Like, he tries to score and stuff. But, like, that's the reason why some of y'all games y'all couldn't win because you're waiting for him to set the play up, plays in the paint, you can pack the paint. Instead of you have an aggressive PG that looks to score, then you can run the play. Mm-hmm. You got to worry about him scoring and the play. Yeah. And a lot of kids just focus on one or two. You got – Juni had both, and that's why he was successful here. There's definitely a lack of, and we've harped on this a shit ton on this podcast, but in terms of mastering the fundamentals, because one, it's not sexy. Two, it's kind of unseen because you can have a broad 
mastering of the fundamentals. And if someone doesn't really know the ins and outs of basketball, they can't really see it because people can see if you have a really good tween cross. But if you have like a really good basic dribble package and the ball never gets stolen from you, like that's way better. But not, it's not sexy. People don't see it. So my, a perfect example is that is my point guard in high school. Led the state in charges. Mm. Didn't know behind the back dribble, in and out, tween, tween, none of that. It was straight crossover, turn to the side, pound dribble, wait for it to happen, pass the ball. He probably averaged three to four points his whole whole time there. Mm-hmm. But he was a coach's son. And his coach was big, well, his dad was big on fundamentals. So when everyone was like, why is he starting? I'm like, he does everything right. My man probably had three turnovers his whole career. <laughs> so, like, why not put him on the court? And a lot of kids don't. Once you get that down, then you can expand your game. Yeah. But if you're, like, some kids are naturally gifted, so it's like you're just born to score and stuff. But if you're not, you got to get those down, concrete, and then move on. Sure. Sometimes even if you are, you're going to reach a level where everyone else is also, also naturally gifted and they have the fundamentals, and now you're just not competing with them anymore. Exactly. I kind of want to go into what, you, what you're doing after basketball now and what your goals are and what you're trying to do in life. Um, my goal in life was just, I want to run my own consulting company. I think more of like, basketball humbled me because I came in thinking I was going to get really good. I had D1 Juco offers, thinking I was going to go somewhere farther for basketball, but it humbled me. It was like, you went Division three at Elms College, no one knows about. I go home and tell people I won't go to Elms. They're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> but it humbled me to where it's like you have to have a plan after. Just how Division One, like if you get hurt, you're, you're done. My, my, I just want to, I don't want to be rich, but I want to live comfortably, be there for my kids and stuff. But like my main goal through this is having a consulting company and then having streams of income like vending machines. A lot of people don't know the little shit like car wash, a laundromat, not just fucking Airbnbs. There's a lot of ways to make sure. money. For sure. Yeah, I've been looking into stuff like that too, and it's sort of the same as basketball. It's like stuff that isn't sexy is usually stuff that works the best. Right. And it makes you a lot of money, and people don't know about it. Like, I'm going into, I have a sales internship uh, in Milwaukee this summer, and like, it's door to door. I'm gonna get my door slammed in my face 50 times a day, but like, developing the skill of sales, it's not necessarily sexy, but it's like, that's what makes most of the money. A lot of people don't do the, the, the dirt, yeah, the dirt work, and that's why they're like, oh, why can't I find a fucking job? Well, motherfucker, you didn't put the work in. Mm-hmm. We, we don't walk into, we don't inherit money or fortunes in life. Is you you got to be selective. Like, we we just don't walk into that shit. Mm. So you got to grind. I want to retire my mom. So, like, my, my goal is to make more money. And if it's taking a few years of my life, then fuck it. In a few years from now, my mom's sitting in the fucking beach house. That's what I want. Sure. Do you think that mindset comes from the fact that you didn't have a lot growing up, yep. so you were forced to work for it? I grew up... I want to say, I grew up, my mom's a single mom. So we grew up, I, yeah, I don't know what it is, PG County, it's the slum. But growing up, sharing meals with your sister, roaches everywhere, mice in your bed, fucking mice shit everywhere. You learn, I, I, that was the thing, I was starting to get into gang violence where I used to live. Then she moved, to, moved me to some bumfuck country place in Virginia, and it changed my whole life. Now I, you know, I'd probably be dead or in jail if it wasn't for her moving me out of that. But growing up, facing that adversity at a young age made me who, like a lot of people stick to that life. Mm-hmm. I don't want to stick to that. I didn't want to stay there. I wanted to, wanted to change because I saw her struggle working 80 hours a week, two jobs, trying to feed us. Meanwhile, we still eating ramen Four nights out of the week, mm-hmm. Friday we get a little chicken and fr- chicken egg and fries, and we split it. But like that was my motivate. I wanted wanted to provide for her, but also to show her that like you didn't fuck up with me. Mm-hmm. Sure. 
But that's definitely a mindset I think is lacking in the current generation of like to just get down and get after it. Yeah. It's also bad parenting nowadays. Kids get well, whatever they entitled. want. Kids get what they want. They feel entitled to getting what they want. So like same thing with basketball. If a kid it got money and he's on the AAU team, he expects to play. Mm. But if you suck and you have a good coach, he's not going to let you just play. And then you get the bitching parents. Like, why is my son? Well, he sucks. But if you go other areas, if you got money and you pay for it, those shitty kids going to play. While someone like me, who just found, like, cut grass the whole summer, just got enough money to play, who's better than everyone on the team, is probably going to sit on the bench. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're going to implement when you have kids? That kind of mindset of grind and get after it? Oh, for sure. They are not to be sitting in the house. Mm. Electronics will come when it comes, but like those first few years, like I can't do the tablet kids. Yeah, for sure. That those kids go brain dead by the age of 20. So <laughs> Yeah, I grew up on a farm, so I didn't get a phone until I was... Because parents still don't have phones. My parents still don't have phones. Like, yeah, I, my house in King... Well, my old house in King George, Virginia, we lived on a field. Yeah. Cornfield right behind us, water Landline. Yeah, I grew up with no phone. I didn't get a phone until sophomore year of high school. So like, I had some of the best memories of my life not having a phone. Exactly. That, that was that was the times. Now everyone just sits in the house. <laughs> That's all I got I for right now. So uh, what's one piece of advice you'd give to your younger self? Be humble with everything that hits you. Like, don't... So if you, I don't, like, I have an Audi A6 outside. I don't post that stuff. I don't flash money. I make great money. And then being good at, I didn't, I wasn't, like, I talk shit, but I wasn't, like, de- downgrading people. A lot of kids look at basketball as a, like, to showcase your talent, but also to shit on people. And we don't have that. Like Ant, for example, that's just competitive nature. Some people do that. People also just do it to downgrade people yeah. and make them feel like shit. I I want to be humble, so after I walk out of a place, everyone knows me for like being the humble, nice guy. So when I left Elms, everyone knew me not for a piece of shit. Everyone knew me as DJ, the guy around school. For sure. Fucking great way to end the episode. Thank you for making the time today.